Salome and welcome to the 2017 Homeschool Family Conference and this is session one, Parenting by the Book. My name is Ann Elliott and I'm the creator and founder of homeschoolingtora.com. In this very first session, I want you to be sure that you have a pen and paper handy. If you look down below the video, you can download a handout that has all of the verses that we're going to be going through so that you can be sure you don't lose track of where we're at and what we're talking about because I'm going to go through a lot of information really quickly. This first session is basically an introduction to parenting from the Word of God. The Word of God, the Bible, is our our guide, our roadmap, our blueprint. And then we're gonna talk a lot about blueprints and building today, so we'll use the word blueprint. And without the scriptures, we have no concrete way of knowing what God thinks we should do with our parenting. I mean, we can go to the library, we can look at a lot of books. I've done that a lot in my life, and you end up feeling a little bit confused because the different authors disagree with each other, and and you're not quite sure which one's right and you're, you're pick one that sounds good, fits your kids and how their personalities are and you're not sure if you're actually getting good advice. So what we're gonna do today is we're going to look at the book, the Word of God, to see what our Creator says about parenting and we're gonna go straight to that. Um, this is gonna be a lot of uh, philosophy and not so much method. In our other sessions later on as we go through this week we're going to talk about concrete ways to put these things into practice. Today we're going to give you the foundation and in fact the foundation is a really good place to start. We're going to first start by talking about what to build. Um, we're, we're going to portray your children and their education and just their, not even just their education, but their total growth and into adulthood as a building. And we're going to talk about what to build, and then we're going to talk about why we're building that, and then we're going to talk about how, okay? So we're going to start with 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. And before I read these verses, I just want to share with you, we were praying about this session for many, many weeks. What are we going to say? How are we going to know what to say? You know, we have seven children ourselves, but that doesn't make us necessarily experts, our children have problems. We have problems. We don't do everything perfectly. And, and I begged Jehovah, I said, please, by your spirit, show us what we are supposed to talk about in this video. And you know, he gave us this passage again and again and again. And finally, one day I went, you know, I think he wants me to talk about this passage. So we're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. Uh, Paul is the writer here and he says, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. And that's how it is sometimes with us as parents. We do lay the foundation. We're the first ones that have access to our children, but other people will build on it. Let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Yeshua, the Messiah. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he, he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire." Those verses are sobering because they tell us that the things that we are building into our children have eternal consequences. The things that we do today and tomorrow and the next day and all throughout this school year will matter for eternity because we are building a building. And you know, we have to choose the materials that we are going to use to build into our children good character, sound judgment, and wisdom. And if we do not choose the good materials, we might not notice it at first. Just as if you can look at a structure and you might think that it is really strong and sturdy. But later, when a windstorm comes up or a fire hits it, then you realize it was not as strong and sturdy as you thought. You know, right behind me, if you look in last year's videos, there were two trees. Um, today, there's just one because a couple days ago, the tree that was on this side just fell over. It looked beautiful. It had flowers all over it. In fact, we got the flowers off of the tree that fell over and put them all over our Sabbath table. 
but unfortunately inside that tree it was rotting and things things were not healthy at all but we had no idea well we're going to make sure that your children are going to be a strong enduring forever building in your notes it says each one's work will become clear when it is tested by fire fire is talking about the day of judgment that is coming on all of the world it is coming for you and it is coming for your children and we want your children to endure and to go into the age to come the, to the millennium to the kingdom of Yehovah and and to be enduring there if it endures we will receive a reward you are given a trust a stewardship with your children and everything that you do matters and you want to someday look in front to your father and have him say well done good and faithful servant but if it is burned we will suffer loss i don't know if this burning is literal or symbolic i tend to think it's probably literal because of other passages of scripture but we want the works that we do to endure we do not want to suffer loss can you imagine having your children get to adulthood and realize that everything you had poured into them was for nothing because they did not endure they did not stick to it they did not believe what you believed they did not hold the scriptures to be of utmost importance to them and you look at them with such sadness you do not want that to happen so let's talk about it first of all most important the foundation these verses are very clear. The foundation is none other than Yeshua, the Messiah. No other foundation. You know, as we come into Hebrew roots, as you learn about messianic things, as you realize that all of the Bible, all 66 books are important and urgent for us today, it can be tempting to start to doubt. We say, well, we were taught fa false doctrine, and I'm not sure if the things that I were taught was taught are true and so we start to doubt everything we question until the day comes that we say you know what I don't even think Yeshua is the Messiah I don't know if I believe anything anymore and that whole foundation is crumbling and falling apart do not let that happen to you whatever you do that what curriculum you choose what what discussions you have what congregation you attend be sure that the foundation is Yeshua the Messiah for without him the whole building fall um, however what is the thing that brings us to the Messiah this is very clearly answered in the Word of God in Galatians chapter 3 verses 23 and 24 it says before faith came we were kept under guard by the Torah kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed therefore the Torah was our tutor our schoolmaster to bring us to Messiah that we might be justified by faith. We emphasize the Torah in our homeschooling curriculum because the Torah is our schoolmaster. It is our tutor, which brings us to faith in Yeshua, the Messiah. He is our foundation. And if we are going to build on him, the foundation, we must use the correct tutor. So if you are using a curriculum or a method of teaching your children that does not emphasize Yeshua, the Messiah, and use the Torah as a tutor to get you to him. You know, if it denies the tutor and tries to use a different tutor, then your foundation is wobbly. It is not secure, and you may not see an enduring result in your children. On the other hand, if you use the tutor and, and start to worship the tutor instead of the foundation, then you are very much missing the point. The foundation is not the Torah. The foundation is Yeshua the Hamashiach, and the tutor brings you points to him, always guides you to him, brings you to repentance and to faith and to good work. Okay, let's talk about the building materials that you're going to build on to your, your building that you're building with your children. In 1 Corinthians 3, it says there are six materials that you can use. The first one is gold. The first three are gold, silver, and precious stones. To me, they kind of go together, and when you start looking at verses in Scripture, you see a lot of uh, words going back and forth. And you're going to see gold and silver, gold, silver, precious stones, gold, and, you know. Anyway, they all are kind of similar, but let's talk about gold. Um, gold, I'm just going to tell you right away what I think it is. Gold, I think, is wise instruction in the Torah. Again, as the Torah is our tutor, this is the very first and most important and most precious of all of the building materials that you should use. I'm going to read a lot of verses here. I did list them on the handout, and I'm just going to start going right down through them. 
and let you look him up if you want to later. The sun is so bright. You know what? I think I might move. Give me one second. I scooched back a little bit. I am back where it's not shining in my eyes so much that I can actually see what I'm doing. All right, we were gonna talk about gold. It is wise instruction from the Torah. First of all, let's talk about the value of gold. In Joshua 6, 19, 6, 19, it says, but all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to Yehovah, and they shall come into the treasury of Yehovah. Gold is consecrated to him. And that is one of the things I think when we think about our children, we want to consecrate them to him for his purpose, for his service, for in his kingdom, in his tabernacle, in his temple. And while that is symbolic, I want you to think of your child as very precious. And so therefore you're not going to build on him with yucky ingredients that have no value. The Torah is going to be gold as we see. In 2 Chronicles 2, 7, it says, uh, Solomon said, send me at once a man skillful to work in gold and silver and so on, skilled to engrave with skillful men, as it says later. So not only is your child consecrated to Yehovah, but you want to use skill. Guess who the skillful man who's building is? That's you. You are the one who is to have skill. So guess who needs to have gold first in his or her own life? You, need, you do. You need to be so grounded in the Word of God and in Scripture that you have skill in putting it into someone else. And now, don't be worried if you say, I don't have that skill. I'm sorry, but I, I'm new to this. I don't know the Word of God very well. Don't worry. We'll be right beside you. We'll help you. We'll give you that skill. I do believe, most importantly, that you have the Ruach, the Spirit of, of God, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy set apart spirit who is himself consecrated to give you the power that you need. You can ask him for help, beg him for help, ask him to give you the words, to take you to the verses, to show you what you are to do, and he will do that. Okay, now let's talk about um, the Torah itself being gold. Psalm 19, we're going to come back to the Psalm in a few minutes. Psalm 19.10 says, More to be desired are they, which is the commands, the laws, the statutes, the ordinances of Yehovah. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. They are sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. In Psalm 119, 127, David says, Therefore I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. In Proverbs 3, verse 14, it talks about wisdom coming from the Torah, and it says, Wisdom's proceeds are better than the profits of silver, and her gain than fine gold. In Proverbs 8, 10, it says, Receive my instruction and not silver knowledge rather than choice gold. The Torah is compared to gold, the finest gold there is, pure gold. Um, in the book of Revelation, we see that the streets of the kingdom of heaven are lined with pure gold that is so pure you can see through it. I believe that is a reference to the Torah being the streets that we walk upon. I mean, every step, every, every path that we take will be built upon the pure gold of the Torah, of the instructions and words of God. Now, it says that wisdom is better than gold. In Proverbs 16, 16, it says, How much better to get wisdom than gold? And to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. You know, one of the things that we think about as we're parenting is what career do we want our children to go into? What jobs do we want to prepare them for? How will they provide for their family someday? How will they pay the bills? You know, make sure they have a good job. How are we going to get them a house and everything that they need and put the money into it? And yet the Word of God says that the Torah and wisdom is better than fine gold and more, better to be chosen than fine gold. If you were given two choices for your children, if you were given millions of dollars and you, anything you need will be provided for your children or you were given a Bible, which one is better to choose for your children's education? I think our hearts, our, our flesh would say easy to choose. I would choose the millions of dollars that will make everything so much easier. But he says that it is better to choose wisdom from the Torah than to choose fine gold. That is not to say that gold and riches are not good, but to say that they don't endure, not endure like the Torah does, but which endures forever and ever, never changes, and is always to be relied upon. 
Um, there are some other things that are better than gold. In Proverbs 22, verse 1, it says, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. So before you choose a great occupation with good wealth for your children, choose for them a good reputation, which takes character. It means that you have to teach them that character, and thankfully the Torah is the tool for that. In Proverbs 27, verse 21, it says, The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, and a man is valued by what others say of him. As your child is that foundation, that house is being built, others are watching, and the reputation that your child has with the outside world is of more value than any amount of salary or, or paycheck that your child will ever get. In Proverbs 25, verses 11 and 12, it says that um, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver, like an earring of gold. I don't think I have gold on today. But an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise rebuker to an obedient ear. The, <coughs> the wise rebuker is you, mom, and you, dad. You are the wise rebuker to an obedient ear. So teaching your child to be obedient to your words and your instruction and your wisdom coming from the Torah, not from yourself, your wise rebuke and correction and training to your child is of more value than the purest gold. Just think about that for a second. Your job as a parent is so important. Proverbs um, 16, 16, how much better to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather than silver. I think I was supposed to wait a second on that verse, but yeah, you get the idea. Gold from instruction from the Torah. We're going to come back to the Torah in a few minutes and talk about what exactly it is. But let's go on to silver. Silver is good words. So we know where you to use to build on the foundation or to use the Torah, which is wisdom, which is better than gold, um, which will give your child a good reputation and is better than money. Okay, so we got that. The second thing we need to build is good words, good instruction. That verse I just read, let me read it again because I wasn't looking at the right thing. How much better to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding is to be chosen rather than silver. I think understanding, <coughs> when I think of understanding, I think of someone walking along beside me and explaining things. Wisdom from the Torah is great. I can read it, but sometimes I don't understand it and your children are no different. They need a mom and a dad to walk beside them and to say, no, this is how it works. This is the practical application in how you do what we just taught you. If you don't know how to apply it, you don't have any understanding and understanding is silver. So I want you to see something. And when we look at silver in the word of God, it often talks about our speech, our words. So your words are building a foundation on your children good words, kind words, gracious words, loving words, and words based in the Torah so that scripture pours out of you, that will build a strong house for your child. Words of anger, words of cutting down and scorn and sarcasm and, and meanness, or words that are just filled with human wisdom, humanism, human philosophy, atheism, those things will tear your child down. Let's look at some more verses to build this. In Proverbs 10, verse 20, it says, The tongue of the righteous is choice silver, and the heart of the wicked is worth little. The, the tongue, you are the righteous one training your children, and your tongue is choice silver. The material to be used to build in your children is your speech, your words, and they have to be based in the Torah. Proverbs 25, 11, we read this before, but a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. So your word, fitly spoken, appropriately, kindly, in the right situation, thoughtfully applied to your child, will build on that foundation. Let's go on to precious stones. By the way, I wanted to say, what does the word precious mean? I think the word precious means costly. Something that costs something. If something is precious to me, it's because it cost me something. My child is precious to me because it cost that child nine months of my life being pregnant to bring forth that baby and it is very precious. But by the time my, my son is 21, he's even more precious to me because I have invested 
so much into him. Let's see what some of the things this, the scriptures say are precious. First of all, in Proverbs 20, verse 15, there is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Precious, costly. In other words, to give your children lips of knowledge, to use gold and silver, to use the Torah and good words, is going to cost you something. It is not easy. I'm not telling you the easy path today. It's hard. It's very hard. You're going to have a lot of agonizing years ahead of you as you try to say, what is my, how do I fight my sin nature to be the parent that I'm supposed to be? I'm not giving you the easy path. I'm giving you the costly path. This is not the easy route to parenting where you drop your kids off at, at easy solution in the morning and pick them up at easy solution in the afternoon. No, this is going to be costly. This is going to take a lot of your effort and your time. Let's go on to Ecclesiastes 7 verse 1. It says a good name is better than precious ointment. A good name is costly. If you want your children and yourself to have a good reputation, it is going to cost you something. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, and in this case, silver or gold is called corruptible because it is, it is not as enduring as the Word of God. From your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, that's, those are the things you are not redeemed by, but you are redeemed with the precious, costly blood of the Messiah, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. His blood spilled for you was costly. When we wrap our heads around the things, the, what His blood cost our Heavenly Father, we will start to value it as He values it. We don't bring up the human traditions around us. Those human traditions are not the things that we base our parenting and our decisions upon, but we base them again on the foundation of Yeshua, the Messiah, His precious blood. It is costly, costly to His Father. Imagine it being your son. Matthew 13, 45 and 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. The kingdom of heaven is costly and valuable and worth everything. And this man sold all that he had in order to get it. So this takes us to Luke 14, verse 28. And I think this is a really key verse for parenting. It says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? You know, if you are building, you already have your child. You've already, you're not sitting down to prepare to have a child. Maybe you are, maybe you're watching this, but most of you watching this will already have your children. You've already decided probably to homeschool your children. Have you counted the cost? It's not free. And I'm not talking about money. Yes, it costs money to buy curriculum and print things and get printers and internet connection and take them to, to museums and take them on field trips and get, you know, shoes and clothes and books for them. Those things do cost. But what I'm actually talking about is the cost to you personally in investing of your time, investing of, you know, your, your decision each day to read the Word of God on your own and to study it and to know it. That costs something. You're going to have to give up something else in your day, in your life, in order to invest in your children. But you're building something of eternal value. Now I'm going to go on to page two of your handout, and I'm going to go a little bit more quickly through this section. Um, these are the, th the three building materials that you don't want to use. I'm not going to go into as much detail, or we're going to be here for hours. First of all, though, you have wood. Wood is useful for lots of things. It's useful for making fires. Oh, and remember we were talking about being tested by fire. It's useful for making idols and statues and covering them with gold. That's found all over the Word of God. Um, by the way, I, I've got these from just looking up the word wood in the scriptures. I went into my concordance and I typed it in, in my, on my computer and these came up. The third one is it's in the, in the scriptures. It's useful for making sukkahs or temporary booths or buildings and, that you would go into. Um, in Isaiah 1.8, you can look that one up on your own. It talks about a man that built a sukkah so that he could oversee his vineyard and make sure that everything was safe in it. It's a temporary thing. Who wants to build a temporary structure that is easily destroyed, easily taken down in their children? Um, you can see that this is not the value you want to use. 
we have hay, which can also be translated in the scriptures as grass. Um, grass and, and hay are not a good building material. Obviously, you can think of the story of the three little pigs. Um, Psalm 92, verse 7. I need to turn here to it. It says, When the wicked spring up like grass, and when all the workers of iniquity flourish, it is that they may be destroyed forever. Grass is incredibly temporary. Yes, it's beautiful to look across the lush green lawn, but it is temporary. It will not stay green. Yes, it's helpful for cows to eat it and make good milk and, and meat and so on, but it is temporary. It is not going to last like gold and silver and precious stones. In Isaiah 40 verses 7 and 8, it says the grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of Yehovah blows upon it, and surely people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. So it compares people to the word of God. So as you're choosing materials, if you're choosing the words of people, their wisdom, their insight, their counsel, it will not stand, it will not last. No, and sometimes we are so easily deceived. We think that the things we're listening to are from God or from, you know, that even our own thoughts are from God until you get your Bible out and you start to look it up and actually read and you go, you know what, I was completely off and I didn't even notice it. The words of people, people are grass. They fade, they fall, they're destroyed eventually. But the word of our God stands forever. Finally, we have stubble and stubble. Let's look first in Exodus 15, seven. It says, in the greatness of your excellency, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You sent forth your wrath and consumed them like stubble. Stubble is something that is only meant to be consumed. And I think in this instance, it's talking about their sin. Stubble is in, in a picture in the, in the word of God of sin, of going in rebellion against his commands and his Torah. In Isaiah 5:24, it says, as the fire devours stubble and the flame consumes chaff, so their root will be as rottenness and their blossom will descend like dust. Why? Because they have rejected the Torah of Yehovah of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Specifically, the Torah of the Holy One of Israel, the laws of Moses given to them, when they are rejected, then the outcome is stubble, which is consumed by fire. Exactly what we've been talking about. I'm gonna go one more time though to Malachi chapter four, verse one. The book of Malachi has a lot of good parenting advice in it, just saying. It says, behold, the day is coming. We talked about the day earlier. Burning like an oven and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says Yehovah Sevaot or Yehovah of armies and hosts. They will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, well, hold on there. So stubble is doing wickedness and it will be burned up. I'm going to keep going. Let's read. Let's read a few more verses. It says, to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, Yeshua, Messiah, will arise with healing in his wings and you shall go out and grow fat like stall fed calves. <clears throat> you shall trample the wicked. They shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says Yehovah of hosts. Remember the Torah of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of Yehovah, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. I think that's a pretty good way of wrapping up this section of building materials. In the book of Malachi saying it is very clearly setting the Torah of Yehovah against all other wisdom, all other deeds and actions. We can choose to do what looks good and feels good and sounds good to humanity, or we can choose to do the laws of Yehovah, the, his Torah given to Moses to Israel. Very specific there. Let's talk about why we're even building this. I know, I think it's obviously pretty clear by this point, but let's just talk about it. Why did he even give you children? Why are you a parent? Is it because they're adorable and you wanted it, so you got it? Maybe, but that's not why he gave you a child. In Malachi 2.15, so just turning back two chapters, it says, talking of a, a man and his wife married together, he says, why did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? 
having the breath of his breath in them. Why did he make them one? Because he seeks godly offspring. You can write that in. He desires godly offspring. The word offspring in the Hebrew is seed. And you can follow that word all throughout the, the Tanakh and the apostolic scriptures. And it gives you all kinds of good advice for parenting. You can maybe write that on your handout. I'm going to look up the word seed in Hebrew. Starting, you can look at this Malachi 2.15, see what the Strong's number is, and search it out through the whole Bible if you'd like. But let's take you real quick to Galatians 3, 5 through 7. It says, He who supplies the Spirit breath to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the Torah or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons or the seed of Abraham. Your children, the first and most important thing you can give them, the reason he gave you children is because he wanted you to give your faith to them. You can give them your name, you can give them your nose and your, your eye color, and you can give them a love for all of the things that you love. My children like computers because I like computers. I'm amazed to see how many of my kids like to write, because probably because I do, but those things don't last. The only thing that lasts is to give them, pass on the faith, faith in God, um, which is the only way to become one of the seed of Abraham. The only way to produce godly offspring is not to just have children. Mom and dad are righteous, oh, therefore we, all our children must be. No, the only way is to be born again into the family of God because our seed is all corrupt. Only with faith in Yeshua, our Messiah, only by trusting in him, not by the works of our own righteousness, but only by works of trusting, or only by trusting in Yeshua and belief in him as Abraham did. It, um, it says, um, okay, going back to my notes here so I don't get confused. We are not to be thinking of our children as we raise them up as perpetuating our family line and all of the things that make our family great. Rather, we are to be, so I have in our notes, we are not to be self-focused. We are not raising up our own families. We are to be kingdom-focused. The kingdom is our family identity. I'm an Elliot, and that's cool. I have a lot of really fun things in the Elliot family history, as well as on my, my own parent side and all of our family history. It's cool. It's really fun to do Ancestry.com and find all of this on. But the kingdom of Yehovah is my true family identity. I was born into sin, and only when I repent of that sin and turn in faith because of the blood of Yeshua, my Messiah, is the only way to be born into the family of God and to be his seed. You know, just because I convert to Judaism, just because I make Aliyah to Israel, does not make me one of his seed. It does not matter what my culture, what my my ancestry is because all of those ancestries, no matter what family from on earth you are from, are filled with sin. They are filled with, with revolt from God and rebellion. There is none who is righteous, no, not one. We must repent of our sin and turn in faith to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and say, I will follow you alone in, I put my trust in your Messiah, Yeshua. And when we do that, we are born again. We are made new. We are grafted into his family. We are adopted into Israel. That is the only way to be part of Israel. There is no other way. There is, um, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but through him. It is so important that we give our children a true family identity. Yes, when I read the scriptures, I say to my kids, we are Israel. We are to obey the things that are given to Israel because to be a part of Israel, the way I become Israel is to put my faith in Yeshua and to say, I will follow you, my creator God, alone. But it is not because you were born into the Elliot family that we do these things. It is not because we are Baptist or Methodist or Lutheran or Catholic or any other denomination. It was not because I was born a Jew, which I wasn't. But it is only because of our faith in him. So that's why I'm really pounding this. Because as it said in 1 Corinthians, that is our foundation. Without that foundation, nothing will endure. 
Now, what is what does a family look like that walks in, in, in trust in Yeshua and puts their faith in Him? What, is, what does it look like? Well, it tells us in um, John 13, 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So love is the characteristic that comes from the godly seed being in us, from being part of a kingdom family. We have love. First of all, we have love for Yehovah. And that is summarized in the first five commandments. The first five commandments are, you shall love Yehovah your God with all your heart. You, um, he brought you, you shall have no other gods before me. I'm, I'm looking off of Exodus 20 and I just murdered that first one. You shall not make for yourself any carved images. You shall not take the name of Yehovah your God in vain. You shall remember the Sabbath day and you shall um, honor your father and your mother. Those are the first five that prove to him to show to the world that we love him. Those are the things. Now, so do you want to know what you should teach your children? What is the most important thing for parenting by the book? Teach them the commands. How, what does it look like to your children to not build idols and worship any other God? What does it mean to, to take his name in an oath in vain? What does it mean to keep the Sabbath day? What does it mean to honor your father and mother? Um, as we teach those commands to our children, we are giving them our family identity. We are making them in the image of, of the sons of Abraham. Instead of having a nose that looks like mom and ears that look like dad, as, as the world looks at someone that's keeping the Sabbath, honoring their parents, um, worshiping no false gods, they, they say, wow, I can tell what family they belong to. They look just like that family. The second one, though, is love yet first love Yehovah, then love others. That's the second five commandments. We are to not murder or hit or kill or bite or, or, or punch, or, you know, as siblings do. We are not to commit adultery. We are not to steal. We are not to bear false witness against our siblings or our neighbors. And we are not to covet anything that belongs to someone else. Those things wrapped up together give us a family identity of loving Yehovah and loving others. Okay, so how? Those, we, we've got the, the exact things that you're supposed to teach. You've got the curriculum, and it goes on, and of course the Torah explains exactly how to do all of those 10 things. But, but how do we do this? Let's make it a little bit more practical. I'm gonna go take you to um, Psalm 19, verses seven through 11, and we're gonna spend the rest of our time in this section. And we're gonna talk about the Hebrew meaning of the words here. This is really cool. So let me just read Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. It says, The law, the Torah, of Yehovah is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of Yehovah is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of Yehovah are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yehovah is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yehovah is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yehovah are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. First of all, let's look at, um, or before we do this, I want to say that doing these things is not a method. It is not a method that I'm going to be giving you today. I don't want someone to say, I'm following the Ann Elliott or the homeschooling Torah method of parenting my children. No, 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 no. What we're talking about today is a heart change. This is not a method for parenting. Your family and the way you do things by the Torah might look a little different than how I do it because our personalities, our, our circumstances, our culture, it may be different. But the heart of it is the same what you're doing is grabbing hold of the Torah so that he can, his spirit can come into you and give you a new heart that longs to seek after his Torah and to do what it says. So this is not a method, but a heart change. Keep that in mind, please. First of all, the Torah of Yehovah. I have so many notes here. I'm going to be going back and forth. I'm going to get confused, I think. I'm going to try to do this. Um, and it says the Torah. What is the Torah? Um, first of all, the Torah is, in, in, in Hebrew, it has a, the, the ancient Hebrew, I'm going to show you the pictograph on the screen here, is of a hand and of a head and of someone going, oh, 
So this hand is kind of thrown out and it's pointing with, a, you know, to this head and it's making someone say, ah, oh, and it, to me that's such a cool picture. The mom is pointing, saying this is the path, this is the way to go, and then putting it into someone's head and that person is going, oh, I get it now. And it's such a cool definition. The Torah directs us in a straight path. It um, keeps us going in the right direction. It's, it's someone actually pointing the way out. Um, it's, it's a teacher. It's, someone, it's an instructor. Sometimes the word instructions could be, could be substituted for the word law or Torah. It's certainly not law like a courtroom or like a list of rules, do's and don'ts. In fact, so much of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible are simply stories where the person, where you see people and, and their choices, good and evil, and you are instructed by watching what happens to them. So it's certainly not a list of rules, and do's and don'ts. The Torah is instruction. It's saying, this is the way, walk in it. Okay, that's a verse from Isaiah. Um, it says that, ah, uh, where did it go? It says the, the Torah of Yehovah is perfect. The word perfect means to fill something up, like water filling up a container. Um, until it gets to the mark and keeps going and overflowing. So, like filling up a four cup measuring cup under the sink in your kitchen and it fills and fills and fills and then overflows all over the place. That is what it means to be um, perfect, filled up, overflow. Another way of saying that would be also mature, growing up to the right stature and keep on going. All right, so you want your children to grow up, to be mature, to be filled to overflowing. The Torah is what does that. And it does that by converting the soul. Converting means to, to turn back. It, this it is the word shuv, which, from which we get teshuva. If you've been in the Hebrew Roots movement very long, you've heard that word. We make teshuva, we repent, we turn. We turn around from going this way and we turn our actions and we repent and we go the other direction. It converts, it turns. And, and the word comes from pressing in, to secure oneself to a house. I want you to imagine Piglet in the middle of a windstorm and Piglet is being blown away and he turns around and he grabs onto something sturdy like a house and he holds onto it with all his might so that he won't be blown away. That's what it means to turn. To turn is not just to simply go, huh? But to, you know, to turn and to grab onto it with everything that you have. And finally, um, converts the soul. The soul is your whole life. It's not just a soul, like I used to think of souls as something spiritual, you know, you die, you have a soul that goes to heaven. That's not at all what this is talking about. Your soul is your breath, it's your life, it's your person, it's everything about you, it's your child, it's everything about them, their personality, their breath, their life, their body, it's everything. So it converts everything. So I'm going to just kind of summarize this. It makes our children mature and it turns them back to that house like Piglet. The house not being your house, but your family identity in the kingdom of Yehovah. Torah makes us mature, overflowing with wisdom so that we turn back and we press in to secure ourselves to that house again with all of our breath. Isn't that kind of cool? So let's go to the next one. Um, number two, the testimony of Yehovah is sure, making wise the simple. And the word testimony there means witnesses. So I have the witnesses of Yehovah. What we are, we've been pounding on the Torah, but what are the witnesses? Um, the witnesses of Yehovah are very clearly defined in scripture. First of all, you could go right here in Psalm 19 up through one through six, and it will say, um, let me get it here. It says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. And day unto day, they utter speech and night unto night, they reveal knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. And it goes on. So you should read that on your own. So the heavens and the earth are a witness that tell of the story of Yehovah. And this is very practical for school. We need to study science. We need to study the heavens and the earth because they point to our creator. And we need to do it in a context where it points to the creator and not to him. evolution. But we need to do that. In Romans 1, 18 through 20, it says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is made known to them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. There's no abstract principle that is not concretely displayed in the world around us. The most difficult of concepts about 
our Heavenly Father can be made simple by just going outside and studying His witnesses, His testimonies, His, his mm, broadcasters of His truth, which He made. Um, so we can see um, that the heaven and the earth are the first of the witnesses. Um, let me go back to Deuteronomy 6-7. It says, You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So the, that gives us the time period in which we are to kind of point out to our kids the witnesses. You know, from the time your kids are really small all the way to the time they're older and, and approaching adulthood, you need to be pointing out with discussion the witnesses of Yehovah. So let's look at these witnesses. Heavens and the earth. Scripture songs. Um, Deuteronomy 31 is one example of a song that was written to be a witness against us or to us. And other ones would be the song of Moses after the Red Sea. You know, anytime there's something significant in Scripture, there's an entire book of Tehillim, um, this book of Psalms, that we are to um, use as witnesses. And you can sing these. Um, the book of the law, the Torah, prophecy. It says in Hosea, so studying not just the Torah, but the rest of the Tanakh. And, and even into the apostolic scriptures, there's a lot of prophecy there too, obviously. Prophecy is a witness. We are to study it. So there, I think that's history. We are to study history, we're to study science, we're to study the Torah, we're to study the Old Testament, we're to study the New Testament. And then it says the tabernacle in, or the temple in Numbers, that is a witness. You know, it says in the Torah that we're to go up three times a year to, to, to Jerusalem. We don't have a temple. We can't take our kids to that one right now, but we can still take them up. You know, I don't have the money to do that quite yet. That's something our family is working on to get our children up to Israel because it is a witness. And the more witnesses you can expose your children to, the more secure their foundation will be. Um, notice what it will do. It says it makes the wise simple. It makes the simple person wise. A simple person is someone who isn't smart enough to know what's true and what's not true. Um, it, there's someone who is easily persuaded. The, the, the Hebrew word picture here is that a mouth gives a mark to someone and they go, oh, you know, for a little child, you could say, here's a sucker. Will you get in my car with me? And this, you know, the child will go up to a stranger and say, I love suckers. Oh, I'll get in the car with you. That's a simple person. They're easily persuaded and, and they are, um, seduced and deceived easily. But I don't think that it means that they're evil. It's just that they're childish. They're little. They don't know better. Um, I think sometimes this characteristic goes on into adulthood. That's a terrible thing. But to be simple is just to mean that you just don't know any better and you're easily deceived. But how do we get our children to not be simple anymore? By showing them his witnesses. That's so cool to me. It gives them wisdom, and in this in this verse, um, if you look at the word pictures for wisdom, wisdom is di dividing the helpful and good things from chaos. In the in the word picture, it has a wall that then it has an open palm, which is is significant. It means to be helpful, to have someone give you a helping hand, and then it has water, which is a picture of chaos, or you know, think of the deluge or the flood of Noah's time. So. There is someone to be dividing this open goodness from chaos. Wisdom is taking a simple person who is easily persuaded and helping them learn the difference between helpful things and chaos. That's great. Um, and what does it do? It makes wise the simple and it's sure. The word sure means um, it has a picture of a seed. We've been talking about our offspring, our seed, has a picture of a little seed there. You can see it on the screen and it has ox and water. Um, the, the strong, powerful one is going through many waters, many, many chaos, chaotic things to pass on the seed. The, the, the idea is to powerfully pass on strength to the next generation that nothing can prevent that. Um, so it passes on strength to the next generation. So see how important it is to study these witnesses. The third one is the statutes of Yehovah. Statutes are the things that say, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't go over that line. I get that because in, in um, the Torah, in the Hebrew word for this, 
um, the statutes are, are things that you count. So as something comes through the door, you count it. And the next thing comes through the door, you count it. And the next thing comes through the door, you count it. Um, that's the picture in the, in the Hebrew. So it's an accountant. It's someone who is an overseer, someone who is guarding and commanding and directing. They are the person that counts all of the things. And it says that his statutes are right. That the word right means like a, a rope held tightly, taut, and it will not be sagging. Okay, it's, it's um, firm. So his statutes, the things that you count and oversee as they come in your door are always firm and right. Um, means that you, there's a, a line to be drawn in your house. In your house, the Torah will be followed. I will hold firm the line. I will count each day. I will check. I will, I will be consistent. I will look and say, are must, his statutes, his right rulings, are they being firmly held? You know, who's, who's responsible for doing this? I was thinking about this and of course my first response was it's the father. The father's responsible for this. See, my husband doesn't do it. See, it's all his fault. That was my first response. And then I looked at 1 Timothy 5.14. I'm going to read that for you. 1 Timothy 5.14. I desire that the younger widows or women marry, bear children, manage the house, give no opportunity to the adversary to speak reproachfully. How do we keep the adversary from not speaking reproachfully of our house? Well, we manage it. The word manage is so soft there in the English. In the Greek, it means to rule. Just like that person counting everything through the door, the overseer, the director, the commander, the ruler, the person who holds the firm line is the woman. Moms, you are responsible. Yes, your husband is directly responsible. He is over your home. Yes, you are to submit to him, but as much as you are given ability, you are the person who manages it, who oversees it, who rules it, who makes sure the line is held tight. That's your job and it is not anyone else's. Let's look at um, what happens. Where am I looking? Oh, right here in this verse, it says, um, the statues of Yehovah are right and they rejoice the heart. When we do that, when we hold firm that line and we keep it steady, his list of things, don't do this, I will not allow this in my house, then it rejoices our heart. And the word is like a bubbling, spilling up of joy that just comes from our inner passions. It is just a, a heartfelt laugh from your belly. That's what it gives you. When you do that, when you hold that line, um, unfortunately, in Proverbs 29, 15, it says the rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. In Proverbs 10, 1, it says a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the grief of his mother. So in one, you have this bubbling up laughter and joy because if she's, this woman has held tight. She has managed her home. She has not allowed anything evil against the Torah to come in. And the other is someone who has just let her kids go done her own thing, just kind of been lax about it. The line is sagged because she just didn't get around to it. She didn't give a rod. She didn't give rebuke. She didn't give reproof. She didn't give correction. She didn't say, no, you may not do that. And now she has shame and horrible grief. And there are a lot more verses in Proverbs. In the next session, we're going to go into some of those, sadly. Um, the, the, the word of rod is a walking stick that has teeth on it. It's pretty clear. It doesn't mean that we have to spank. It means that our consequences, though, whatever they are, have to have teeth in them. We have to make sure that we are holding that line with teeth in it. Mom, show your teeth. Be strong. Stand up. Make sure that the right and the wrong is done in your house. It's your responsibility. Okay, let's go on to number four, because that one was kind of sad. Number four is the commandments of Yehovah are pure. The commandment of Yehovah is pure, enlightening the eyes. This is positive training. The word commandment in, in this one is to lay upon a man a revelation. It is, there's a man lying in wait on his side with a nail to stick in the ground to give light and revelation to someone. So this is someone, this is the mom, dad, lying in wait to go, oh kids, look at that. I gotta show you something, this is cool. And all the kids going, oh, neat. But notice it's someone lying in wait for this. They're waiting in expectation to show this revelation to someone else, to put their peg in the nail. So um, this is positive training. This is going, oh, kids, 
I got to show you how amazing the Torah is. You got to see this amazing thing that we get to do to serve our God. And when we do it, it makes them clean. This verse says it's pure and the word is clean, like something that's been polished with soap. All right, if you like to make soap, you get this illustration more than others might. But polishing something with soap, sudsy, scrubbing it clean, it makes it polished and sharp and beautiful and makes it clean. The second one is it gives intense light to the eyes. So it makes, wow, everything makes sense now. And it brings order. I get the order from, um, let me see where I found that from, um, in, in the word um, uh, light, that word can also be translated as order, bringing order to a path. So that everything is chaos and clutter and confusion. It brings order. Okay, so number five, the fear of Yehovah is clean, enduring forever. Now this clean is different from the one before. Um, it's not pure. The pure one is where it's washed with soap. This clean one is where there is no mixture. There is nothing. Um, it's pure. I, if I were the translator, I would have done it different. But see, I'm not the translator, and that's a good thing because I'm really not that good at this. I'm just looking things up. But to be pure is to, or to be clean in this one, is to be free from pollution, free from anything that is coming in to make it... Um, not not 100 percent so let's say you have 100 percent pure water but you put a little bit of little just a tiny little bit of powder of poison in it and you can drink that water and die because it's been adulterated it's been um it's been polluted it's not 100 percent so this one is the word clean in the english at least in the new king james version but it in my mind is more what pure means but anyway it's it is something that has been mixed in it has got dirt in it it has got poison in it it's got something um in it that's not good for you so um mixture and impurity we can prevent mixture and impurity when we have the fear of yehovah so what is the fear of yehovah um the word fear means to throw up our hands in worship or surrender like i surrender in, in fact the word even means to have your insides turn to terror or turn to liquid would be one way of saying it but um you take your hands and put them up by your head in submission and and, and go I, I i submit um and it's to do some do that to something that is more powerful than ourselves so of course you can submit and and worship things of this world, you can say, I give up, I'm doing it this way, or you can worship Yehovah. Now, believe it or not, that is, is um, equated with mixture or with doing, letting a little bit of bad creep into something that is perfectly good. It is so easy in our homes to let a little bit of bad come in. It happens all the time. It's like a constant yearly, monthly even job to get the bad out of our houses again. And we only do that if we have a fear, a submission to something more powerful than ourselves, which is Yehovah, our creator. If we have that respect and worship and fear of him, we will get out the mixture, get out the impure things. Um, and if so, it says that it will um, endure forever. And the word endure is to stand firm, to not be able to be moved. This is something I want my family to be a family that endures forever. Um, in fact, let's, let's see what the Bible says about letting mixture, impure worship, worship of something other than Yehovah come in and how it does not stand forever. Let's look at just one example. Exodus 20 verse 5. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, Yehovah your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. They will not stand. Their, your iniquity, your mixing of impurity will make your generations, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren fall. It is so important that we don't let mixture come in. This is urgent, but he says he shows mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. 
later he says he visits the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. This should be really sobering. It should turn your insides to liquid as you think about what can happen to your family, how they will not stand if you allow the mixture of idolatry and false worship come in to the good. And notice it just takes a little bit to take pure water and turn it to poison. It doesn't take much. That's the danger. Let's look at some things that should never, ever be in our homes. We're going to read these verses. They're a little long, but you should maybe take your pen and if, if one stands out to you, if the Holy Spirit lays one on your heart and says, this is in your house right now, maybe you should write that on your paper. Ephesians 5, 3 through 7, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as it is fitting for saints or the set apart ones. Don't let it be in your television. Don't let it be in your books. Don't let it be on the posters on your wall. Don't let it be in, on your computer. Don't let it be in any way named in your house. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which is not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Messiah and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, but because, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. Deuteronomy 18, 9-14 says, When you come into the land which Jehovah your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft. Don't let that be in your house, in your books, in your television shows. Or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens. Don't be one who looks at the clouds and says, that cloud is going to tell me how to live my life today. That's how God is speaking. That's not what the witnesses mean. We are not to look at the signs and say, oh, because of this terrible thing happening in the, in the astronomy this year, then I must be afraid and we're under the hills. No, don't, don't practice signs and omens. Nor a sorcerer nor one who conjures spells or a medium. There's a television show called that. Or a spiritist or one who calls upon the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to Yehovah. And because of these abominations, Yehovah your God drives them out from before you. You shall be blameless before Yehovah your God. For these nations which you will dispossess, listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, Yehovah your God has not appointed such for you. What are we to, to do if we find these things in our home? What actions do we take? Well, I think it's really clear in Acts 19.19, 19, the, the believers in the first century, the believers in Yeshua said, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. <clears throat> they counted up the value of them and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Remember I said count the cost? We are not to have anything to do with these things. We're to burn them, we're to get them out of our house, we're to destroy them and we're to, so our families will stand so they will endure forever. Finally, our last point, point number six. <clears throat> the judgments of Yehovah are true and righteous altogether. This one's cool. This one really hit me. Judgments are right rulings over cases, the action of deciding a case. You as parent, you have to do this all the time. You have to make right rulings and decide cases for your family. One, per, one child comes to you and says, that's not fair. So-and-so took my toy. And you have to rightly decide what is the thing to do. One of the things we're not to do is make a decision on the child that is prettier, the child that maybe pleases us more, the child that um, was first born or second born or looks like your father or looks like this person or is, is just got a personality that fits yours better. No, has absolutely nothing to do that. Um, the, the, the Hebrew pictograph for this has teeth that are making a firm decision on mouth, on the words that are in this clay basket to make a firm decision on the words that are in the basket. So your kids each bring you words and like Solomon of old, you were to have the wisdom to make the decision make a firm decision with your teeth to say this is what will be and it must be fair and just and have no respect of any person oh that's hard but guess what happens when we do this when we have the judgments the fairness the, the equity of Yehovah in our home it is true and righteous true we saw this word a really similar word in a couple verses back it said sure this is a very similar Hebrew word and it means to pass on truth, 
to the next generation. That's what that word means. To, to have it passed on to the next generation, we must be fair and equitable. Can you believe that one of the reasons that sometimes things aren't passed on is because maybe mom likes this child and dad likes that child? Like, can you think of any illustrations of this? I can think of some, Esau um, and Jacob and Esau. Their parents weren't fair. They weren't righteous, they weren't just, not to them. What about David? He loved Absalom and he didn't love some of his other sons as much or train them in righteousness, but he, they loved him so much and never trained him. Um, what about Eli? He didn't restrain his sons from wickedness and they were being unfair and unjust. They were, their, their forks were going down into the pots where the meat was boiling and they were taking out too much. They were robbing the people and Eli did not restrain them. Um, what about Rehoboam? He was advised by the wise and ungodly older men to not lay any more taxes on the people, but he listened to the younger men who said, yeah, milk them for all they're worth. And he, he wasn't fair and just and equitable in his laws, and he, the kingdom was taken from him and given to Jeroboam. What a horrible thing. If we want to pass on truth to the next generation, we must be fair and equitable in our homes as simple as that. What an important parenting truth. Isn't that awesome? But it is also righteous. To be righteous means to stay on the traveled path, to not fall off the edge of the cliff. <laughs> if you want your kids to stay on the path and not fall off the deep end, you have to be fair. Who would ever put those two together? I didn't. I just thought Psalm 19 was so cool. So Psalm 19, as you go back through and you think about, you know, I'm going to put the sources for all of these Hebrew pictographs down below the video so you can find out where I got them from. You can look at them and study them. You can find more verses like them in scripture. They were amazing to me. These aren't methods, as, as you can see. Yes, we have to be fair. Yes, we have to hold the line of Torah. Yes, we have to to lie in wait to teach what is righteous and so on. But they aren't like methods that say on Monday morning do this and on, when this happens then this is what's going to happen. You're going to have to ask the Holy Ruach to give you wisdom. Wisdom, you know, wisdom is when according to um, one Torah teacher and his name is Brad Scott from Wild Branch Ministries, he says that that, that wisdom is when Yehovah gives you insight into a situation when you've never been in that circumstance before and he tells you what to do. That's, that's supernatural. Um, you've never been a parent before to that child. You don't know what will happen in your home tomorrow or the next day. You don't know what will happen five years. You don't know what your, your child will be in the next generation. You don't know your great-grandchildren and your great-great-grandchildren, but Yehovah will give you wisdom and he will give you insight to make the correct choices if you align your life with his commandments, the laws given to Moses, to Israel. If you align your lives with those righteous instructions and faith, make your foundation the firm and never ending, never going away basis on Yeshua, the Messiah, and you will have a firm home. It will stand forever to a thousand generations. I hope this was helpful to you. In the remaining part, sessions of our, of our conference this week, we're going to get really practical. Next session, we're gonna talk about what to do if you started late and you, you've already got kids that are growing up and you obviously haven't been doing these things. We're gonna talk about that, but even for parents that have new children, little babies, they've, they've definitely had a chance to do anything wrong yet, I hope you'll get good advice and wisdom and practical instruction in session two. And then we're going to go on all week giving you more and more. But I hope that you will take the time to enrich your, your soul in the scriptures. Every morning, get up, spend a little bit of time, study it out, find out what it means, and apply it to your life. And ask the Holy Ruach to give you wisdom for parenting. If you do these things, you will be parenting by the book. Your foundation will be firm, and the things you build upon it will endure even the judgment day. And, and what a lasting legacy you can give to your children. Sh shalom to all of you.